Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back to our continuing series where we talk to reporters, writers, professors, diplomats, former diplomats, uh, former ambassadors, anyone who can talk intelligently about where America is with the state of political polarization and how we got here and maybe the way out. Uh, with us today, it is our privilege to have Stefan Helgeson. He is a retired career U.S. diplomat. Uh, he's a retired career U.S. diplomat who lived or worked in 30 countries on three continents for three decades. He has helped hundreds of businesses succeed in foreign markets in Europe, Asia, and the Pacific Rim. Uh, from 2006 to 2010, he served as the director of the state of New Mexico's Office of Science and Technology and co-authored the state's first comprehensive technology plan. He is currently a policy analyst, public speaker, and author. He served as the honorary German consul for the Federal Republic of Germany in New Mexico. He's written or co-authored 14 books, six of which are on American politics. Uh, some of those include Culture Held Hostage, Liberating America's Endangered Values. Uh, you can find him on his website at stefanhelgeson.com. Um, in 2016, he became a U.S. political commentator for several television and radio stations in Denmark and penned a twice-monthly column for one of Denmark's oldest newspapers. In addition, he does local advocacy, fighting for Black Bears Matter, an advocacy group out of New Mexico, which he helped start in 2018. Uh, did, I get anything, did I get anything wrong with uh, your bio, sir? Nothing wrong. It just makes me tired to hear you say it all. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we'll we'll get right to the meat and the potatoes. Um, you you've been around in America for a while. You've also been a career U.S. diplomat. You you're familiar with other countries. Um, I'm going to get to that in a second. But why did you write this article? The moment you started to like Trump that came out March 16th, about a month ago. Why did you write this article and why did you write it then? And then I'll have some follow up questions, sir. Sure. Marcus, thank you very much for uh, interviewing me today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about my feelings of, about American politics. Uh, I wrote the article because I felt it was time to uh, for us to get in touch with our real selves and our real feelings about uh, the people who lead us uh, in our nation. And it seems to me that we have uh, a national love-hate relationship with our politicians. And some of uh, us hate uh, politicians all the time. Some of us love them all the time. And most of us love and hate them at the same time all the time. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I wrote, I wrote, in a yeah. paraphrase, Abraham Lincoln, anyway. Uh, no, I, I wrote it because I thought it was time for us to uh, really get serious about uh, our feelings about our leaders. And it's my belief, Marcus, that uh, many of us uh, do uh, dis dislike the way Trump uh, acts, but like the way he manages. And I think that uh, is a, a, the yin and the yang uh, and the a day and night of, of our political uh, country right now. Uh, we're, we're not happy most of the time, and uh, we, we've got to get it together or it will all fall apart. So I'd like to read a quote you wrote, and then I wanted to ask you about it. Uh, but the unvarnished truth is that he was better than most people, at least among his competitors. And why did you like him? Because deep down, you know in your heart of hearts that Donald Trump is the personification of what America and Americans have been told all about for a couple hundred years. Bold, brash, full of bravado, fearless, driven, confident, risk takers, and unapologetic for their triumphs. It sounds like when I read the essay, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong, you were saying, yes, Trump is crude. Yes, he used some language that none of us respected. But people are coming around because they're starting to recognize that he is um, their hope. He speaks truthfully to them. He's actually dedicated to the job for all his character faults. Is that a fair summary or am I getting this wrong? 
No, I think you're getting it, it, it right. Uh, but I would also say that uh, most of us, I think, are coming around to the realization that America is like this huge corporation. Or if you want to use another metaphor, it's like a huge ocean liner. You don't turn an ocean liner around on a dime, nor do you uh, turn around a company uh, without top leadership and people who understand the superstructure and infrastructure of the thing that they're hoping to turn around. And I, and I, I would like to think uh, in my heart of hearts, that the American electorate is starting to realize that uh, we are not only uh, the sum of our individual parts, but we are each individual part. And that those each individual parts are sometimes in conflict with one another, such as our uh, upbringing that has taught us uh, don't be too bold and brash, don't insult, don't uh, step over the line. Uh, but at the same time, our coaches on the football field are telling us, uh, make that tackle, take that guy out of the game, uh, win at all at almost all costs as long as you play by the rules. And Donald right. Trump has Donald Trump, Marcus, has beat out his competition time and time again. Um, I you know too many times to uh, ascribe it to pure luck. Um, right, 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 right. Don't you agree? Um, I mean, they said in 2016, and I know a lot of liberals, and they don't like, they almost have a blank amnesia about this. I go, in 2016, they said a foreign government straight up handed him the election. A minority of Americans voted for him. Votes were switched. And that turned out to be completely not true. And then here we are again. And they said, oh, he'll never run again. And Americans will realize that he was bad. And Joseph Biden said, there'll be a national calming and Republicans will walk away from Trump the moment he loses an election. It's the next election and they're still with him. So he's defied um, lies and and uh, opinions that would say, you know, nobody's going to back this guy. They're going to walk away with him. He's done. He's gone. He should just retire. He's still here. He survived everything. They were wrong about almost everything. Well, Marcus, nobody in America likes a loser. We like to say that it's how you play the game that really counts. But we all know deep down inside that that's not true. Um, there are many games that are not played by the rules. And some games change the rules uh, as the game evolves. And America is an evolving nation, uh, a nation that is built on competition, that's built on winning. Uh, uh, the American electorate likes winners. They don't necessarily want uh, to vote for a loser uh, as, for president or anything else. They want somebody who gets in the game, who's optimistic, who cheers the other team members on, who speaks positively about uh, not only the day, but about the, uh, the next day and the future. They don't want somebody who's constantly blaming them or uh, uh, ascribing motives to them that they don't have, such as the MAGA Republicans that Joe Biden loves to talk about that are uh, one step down from Hillary Clinton's deplorables. Uh, we've had enough of that. I think Americans after COVID and after the economic downturn that we've experienced the last two years are tired of that. We want uh, some sunlight. We want some optimism. We want some hope. That's how Barack Obama came uh, to power. That's how yep. he won an election, based on his belief in, in hope and change. Now, could have been a slogan, could have been something he believed in his heart of hearts, but either way, that's what he tapped into. He tapped into America's uh, 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 reservoir of hope. And that's what Donald Trump is tapping into right now. I'll do you one more. Um, Carter Reagan. Carter was president. I wasn't around at the time. But as I understand, he was telling people, well, we need to conserve and we need to cut down. And we had this oil embargo. So we need to change American life. We're going to have to get by with less. And then people really didn't want to hear that. And Reagan came through with it's a new day in America. We can do anything we want. 
and the public wildly shifted to that um, message, including many Democrats who had previously voted for Carter. I, I think you're right. The American people, regardless of what they may say in a uh, third or fourth grade uh, teacher's classroom, like winners and they they don't like losers and they will punish people who seem to be pessimistic and complainy. Marcus, there was a uh, television series a number of years ago called The West Wing. Yes. You prob you've probably probably seen it. Yes, sir. And in, and in that uh, TV series, uh, Michael J. Fox uh, plays a very, uh, how should I say, ideal, ideologically pure, uh, energetic young uh, uh, advisor to the president. And in a moment of truthfulness, he said to the president, he said, the American voter uh, wants uh, some satisfaction. They'll crawl across the desert and drink sand if they know that the destination they're getting to is the one they're hoping to get to. Uh, something uh, along those lines. I'm not saying it as eloquently as Michael J. Fox did, but he was right. And the American voter can only be fooled so many times by uh, Washington elite or politicians, be they on the right or the left, who are uh, filling their head full of dreams while they're emptying their pockets for the other hand. And I've seen this uh, living around the world for a better part of 25 years. I worked in Russia in the 70s. I worked in the Far East. Uh, I've seen how people uh, love the American spirit. And the American spirit is on life support right now. And the only way to get it off life support is to feed it what it needs. And I think what it needs is a very good stiff shot in the arm of some good old fashioned hope with a plan. I love your reference. And with love and respect, I'm going to slightly correct you. The name of the movie was The American President with Michael Douglas and the famous oh, scene with Michael thank J. You. Fox. I remember that scene. I loved that movie. I loved Michael Douglas. I wanted to be him as a teen boy. Um, I just thought he was one of the smoothest guys I'd ever seen. Yeah, at, at West Wing is also a great show. Very involved in politics. The American President, Michael J. Douglas. Everyone should watch it. And the scene with Michael J. Fox, you're right. The, the Amer yeah, I remember that scene. He said they need leadership. They yeah. need someone to follow. They'll they'll do almost Thank anything you. if you provide Thank leadership. You. Thank you for that correction. I'm getting my political uh, uh, soap operas. Oh, these are all like 10, 20 years old. But yeah, they're all, all West Wing's great. American presidents are great. Everybody yeah, should watch yeah, those. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that uh, sometimes art imitates life and sometimes the other way around. But in the case of this, uh, the election of 2016, the Danish government, or rather the Danish national broadcasting system, invited me to sit in downtown, uh, the top of the Hyatt Hotel in downtown uh, midtown Manhattan, uh, Times Square, while we did a live TV broadcast about the election results. And one of the, and it was all in Danish because it was for a Danish audience, but the uh, Danish moderator toward the end of the evening uh, uh, asked us all the same question. What do you think uh, Donald Trump's chances of winning are? And so she went down the line of all these prominent people, the very well-educated professors, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And she came to me, and she said, "Stefan, what do you think Donald Trump's chances of winning tonight are?" And I said, "About sixty percent." To which all of the other panelists kind of snickered, and right. she had a kind of a wry smile on her face. Right. And and she right. said, "Well, actually, would you like to reassess your answer?" And I said, "Yes, I, yeah, I will. I, I'll reassess it. He's going to win by seventy percent." And so at that point, everybody thought I was absolutely nuts. And I walked home to my hotel, uh, got into bed, and the state of Pennsylvania was called, and Donald Trump had won. So anything can happen in American politics, and it usually does. 
your reference to Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan was spot on. Uh, Carter Thank was you. suffering under a, a terrible uh, depression, uh, a national depression at the time. Uh, we had hostages taken in Iran. We had had an oil crisis that uh, gave us uh, no hope whatsoever. And Ronald Reagan came in uh, with a plan, with, uh, with optimism and positivism in his voice, in his manner, and he was believable. He had spent his whole life uh, being an actor and uh, reading his lines well, but also uh, trying to live his ideals when he was a union leader and uh, at other times. So I'm sorry to uh, go on and on about this, but I think that you are right about a number of things uh, this, e this evening. Well, I think Reagan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I, I think Reagan... And I've gotten liberals to admit this begrudgingly and in private circles. They don't like saying this, but they'll admit Reagan was the best at painting a picture and getting everybody to understand where we were going and why we were going there. Like he was yes. the best at getting whether you liked his plan or not. He got everybody on board. Everyone knew what he was talking about, where we were going and why we were going there. And it was very clear to millions of people. Very few other politicians have been able to do that. And I think that exemplifies what you're talking about with the Michael J. Fox moment. Lead us. Lead us. We will follow. But we need real leadership. And I think this gets back to your point about Trump. I think what you're saying is Trump is real leadership, that uh, maybe he's rough. Maybe there's scars. Maybe there's warts. Um, but that he provides real leadership. And that's that's something the American people are attuned to appreciate is that a fair summary yeah and i think it's marcus in our dna as a people in this country that uh, we may uh, criticize those people who are a little larger than life but secretly we'd like to be them or we'd at least like to have what it takes to be them and that's where that uh, a paradox comes in about uh, you know you like Trump even if you hate him. Right. Uh, that that is the quintessential uh, American symbolism uh, personified by one man who is larger than life, and uh, I I didn't create it. Uh, he created his own mythology, uh, but his mythology was only reinforced by his actual decisions and his experience. So you, you, what you need to do these days, in my view, is we're getting close 207 days before the election, is you need to look at the track records of both men. You need to look at uh, not only their, not their rhetoric, but rather their decisions and what those decisions have done to us as a nation, and then vote your conscience instead of your party. Uh, if we all did that, I think we'd be better off as a nation. I, I have, um, you know, I have my own opinions about Trump, but one of the things that got me, and I've seen this recently as the election heats up, which I don't agree with, they're trying to paint Trump out as a warmonger compared to Biden. And when you look at their records, it's clear Trump kept us out of many wars. He turned down attacks. He turned down invasions. And Biden's basically accepted every single one the Pentagon had to offer. And I see liberals jump through hoops trying to go, yeah, but the real warmonger is Trump. And I go, based on what compared to Biden? And they won't Trump get into that discussion. Uh, Trump kept us out of war. He confronted our enemies, uh, South Korea, excuse me, North Korea and Russia. He imposed sanctions on Iran. He also stood up to China. And so there was a not only a method to his decisions, but a meaning behind his decisions, because he kept always in the front of his mind and his, his advisor's mind, what's in it for America. And it is an America first and not America only approach that we have neglected these last nearly four years. And going down this road is a is a road to a dead end. It's not a cul-de-sac. It's not a crossroads. It's a dead end. And Interesting. I think that uh, we all have to wake up to that reality. Interesting. Yeah, I've, I've just something I've noticed. They're like, 
watch out for Trump. He's the warmonger. And I go, not compared to Biden's record, not in the last four years. So that's just total garbage. You can have other criticisms of it. That's just something I've noticed. Um, let me ask you a few questions that relate to this. So the, the, the media is freaking out. Um, and I'm showing a graphic of this in a minute. But apparently, if you look at a bunch of different sources, New York Times, New York Magazine, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, et cetera, um, L.A. Times, I think, covered this. They're talking about African-American people and Latino people are supporting Trump in record numbers, totally opposite, like 2016. Can you explain that phenomenon of a bunch of minorities um, basically not doing what they did in 2016 and seeming to come around and back Trump, maybe not even the majority of them, but significant numbers. Now, that was predicted to never happen, but it seems to be that African-American people and Latino people are perhaps picking up the thoughts that you put out there. Maybe Trump wasn't exactly like what we wanted, but is he not what we need? Well, uh, good question. First of all, I think that... Uh, the Hispanic populations, and I live in the middle of uh, a majority Hispanic population here in New Mexico, right? Uh, and the African American or Black population uh, have been uh, lied to, to put it bluntly, for generations by politicians, both on the left and on the right, uh, or that they have been wooed by these politicians just before election time, only to be sadly disappointed afterwards because the promises that were made were never kept. Uh, Trump, uh, during his presidency, uh, created uh, enterprise zones or zones of new financial investment interest or possibility for the black community. Uh, he uh, has better surrogates now to go out and speak to the, these communities than he had in 20. 15 and 2016, I should, 2016, I should say. Interesting. And I, and I think that the Hispanic population uh, specifically uh, that reside along the border states uh, are uh, well aware that uh, sound immigration policy is the way to strengthen the country, not weaken it. And they know that some of their jobs are being taken away by illegal immigrants that have just strolled across our border as if it were a Sunday walk in the park, while actually hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world are waiting patiently after making their applications for legal immigration at U.S. embassies around the world. So I think that the two communities you mentioned uh, have awakened from uh, an enforced slumber uh, that has been part of their uh, upbringing, if you will, over two or three generations to the point now where they're saying, wait a minute, uh, I don't care what my minister just told me in church, uh, the Reverend Jeremiah Wright or whoever it happens to be, or the Reverend Al Sharpton. I'm listening to Thomas Sowell, and I'm listening to some of the other black voices uh, that are coming out and saying, listen, brothers and sisters, wake up, smell the coffee. Look at your own economic situation. Judge it for yourself. Don't believe what... Uh, your political friends are telling you, believe your pocketbook, believe uh, what's happening in your schools and uh, in your neighborhoods, uh, believe in the fact that the crime is rising, believe in the fact that single parent households are on the rise. We've got real problems and we're not going to solve them by talking about them alone. Tough decisions must be made. And I think that they're coming around to realize that uh, Trump is a decision maker and he's also a decision rethinker. Uh, he's, he's not cut out of the cloth that says, OK, once a decision made, it must be defended at all costs. It can only be defended if it works. If it doesn't work, then we must change. And I think that uh, that's the secret to his success in the business world, being adaptable and flexible. That is something he is, and they routinely criticized him for that. Like, oh, he sure. had this opinion. Now he has that opinion. But another way of looking at it is maybe he looked at it and he found out more and he adjusted his response accordingly. That would seem logical and not stupid. Um, 
Yes, I agree. One of the one of the things that I saw that blew me away was I was watching MSNBC, um, a very liberal show. They had people on the show, they had minorities on the show talking about, I guess these stupid African Americans and stupid Latinos think that the economy was better under Trump. And that's why, I mean, you literally said the pocketbook. So when they're interviewing Latinos and African-Americans, they're finding out a lot of them were saying, say what you will. I had more money in my pocket during Trump. I was making more money. If I was out there in economy selling a business, selling that, I was making more money. And maybe he's not this or that, but I could like that. And then I saw MSNBC criticize minorities for placing their economic interest at, at the top of their reasons for voting. I just... I found that um, incredible that, that somebody would criticize working minority families for placing their economic um, prosperity as, as uh, you know as the top, top thing that was concerning to them. Well, the Washington elites, Marcus, and the uh, uh, media regulars at MSNBC and NPR and other others uh, and. Uh, uh, PBS, for example, that they are fearful, frightened that that loyal demographic uh, is going to desert them uh, uh, in November, and they're pulling out all stops right now to not uh, to appeal to the emotional side of the voter, and I think the uh, if they do that, they do that at their own peril because the emotions of anger and frustration and anxiety and distrust are just as powerful as those emotions of loyalty to a party are. So when people are faced with making tough decisions about their children's future, about their economy and everything else, uh, and then you couple that with a, a, a rapid cultural attack on American values, people uh, can do one of two things. They can uh, fight or they can flee. And I think that the uh, minority communities have realized that uh, staying home is not a solution to a problem. Uh, and staying home away from the, the voting booth, I mean, is not a solution to the problem. I think you're going to see, uh, hopefully, you're going to see a record uh, voter turnout this time around. Uh, the last election, the presidential election, was only decided by like 42 to 46,000 uh, votes in some swing states. If Trump manages to uh, capture a larger share of the minority voter uh, demographic and turns those numbers around, he could effectively win some of those swing states and ruin Joe Biden's chances of getting reelected. So uh, the millions that the Democrats keep, the millions of Democrat, extra Democrat voters that they keep talking about that won the election for Joe Biden were basically voters out of California, where you live, uh, and uh, other uh, solid blue states that would have gone into the Democratic column anyway. So uh, that's not where the battle is being fought. We know that California is going to vote Democrat. We know that New York's going to vote Democrat. We know that Illinois is going to vote Democrat. We know where the blue and the red states are. It's those purple states and those newly turned blue states uh, that are the real battleground. Uh, Michigan looks like it's going to be in contention and the Democratic Party seems to be they seem to be very worried about losing that state and that it had always been one of their linchpins and it looks like there's a group of people called arabs who seem to be quite mad with joseph biden and they well yeah <laughs> Um, I, I think that uh, you scratch the surface of almost any uh, ethnic group in the United States, you'll find a certain amount of anger uh, regardless. But uh, I used to be an auto worker, a member of the UAW back when I was very much younger, uh, worked in an automobile plant. And uh, the automobile workers, UAW workers, um, traditionally have followed their leadership's uh, uh, guide uh, to voting and have voted along Democrat lines because the Democrats, uh, they felt, were always their friends and would always uh, campaign for uh, closed shops where uh, people could not vote on uh, a union presence or not. But I can tell you that the, the mistakes that Joe Biden and the green uh, ideological uh, 
supporters have made uh, with Michigan is going to be uh, is going to come back to haunt them by pushing the UAW and the uh, uh, top three American automakers into electric vehicles too quickly uh, has created a uh, you know, a, a huge parking lot of unsold electric vehicles, right. which is going to which is going to be a threat to those UAW jobs unless things turn around. Right. And the and and you couple that with uh, stopping the Keystone Pipeline and making America more energy dependent, and uh, UAW workers and machinists and. Uh, uh, union workers all over uh, are going to think twice about voting for a president that uh, doesn't know what he's doing. Well, what about inflation? Uh, inflation always hurts the lower class and the working class more than it does the rich class. Uh, inflation's been rampant under Biden and because of his policies. I routinely argue with liberals, if you think he had to do this or that, fine. But let's just admit when the government prints a bunch of money out of thin air, that inflates inflation. It, it doesn't do the opposite of that. Even if you call it an anti-inflation bill, you just increased inflation when you print money out of thin air. That's just the way it works. Well, there's there's a, a, an unflattering part of the American character that we've got to acknowledge here, and I'm glad you brought up inflation uh, because it's called greed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there are always going to be those people, whether they are mm -hmm. people who are greedy for power or people who are greedy for greenbacks, that are going to set the tone and create the, situa the situational awareness for their products uh, and for the economy that are not in the public's best interest. These days, the recent inflation figures at 3.5% grossly underestimate the real inflation that's going on in the U.S. We, we rarely ever mention the inflation cost of services, but we are a service economy, and many of our insurance services and other services uh, are going up at a, a rapid rate. Uh, manufacturers uh, of uh, products, consumer products, are packaging their products in the same size packaging, but with fewer items in them, right. uh, and charging the same amount of money. Now, right. granted, there was a, there was a period of time after co or during COVID uh, where uh, we had supply chain problems, but those supply chain problems have basically been worked out. We do not have the same supply chain problems. What we've got now is an energy crunch and a, um, I would like to, I don't guess I, I can say greediness, a greediness am among the manufacturers that they're not going to lower their prices even if their overhead comes down. And once a price goes up, it very rarely comes down again. And the group that is really hurt the most, and you mentioned the lower class, lower, uh, uh, rung of the economic ladder and the, the middle class, uh, but there's also a significant voting block, and that is retired uh, citizens yep. of the United of the United States, like myself, who aren't getting any more money in their Social Security check or their pension. Money. Fixed income. Uh, it, yeah, we're on fixed incomes, and we're paying a heck of a lot more these days than we were two to two to three years ago. So. Uh, James Carville was right when Bill Clinton was running for president, when he told him it was the economy, stupid. And I, th I think that we're on the verge of that same phrase being repeated, uh, not only by Carville, but by others uh, who are, you know, watching, uh, watching the votes and, and taking the polls. One of the co-authors of my, one of, of two of my books lives in Texas. Uh, his name is Lance Terrence. Uh, he started a uh, public polling company uh, in Washington, D.C. many, many years ago and uh, has since retired and is now living in Texas and is working, to go back to your statement about minorities, is working with uh, the Republican Party in Texas in their outreach to the Hispanic community. And uh, he is of the opinion, as am I, that the uh, tide has turned and that the Hispanic vote is going to, to break for uh, Donald Trump because they see in Trump the same thing that he 
either they or their parents or grandparents saw when they came to the United States. The land of opportunity and possibility, but only if the conditions are right. And they're determined to make the conditions right again. I have great faith in them. I, as a Latino, I can back that up. Um, Latin people are a humble people. We'll put up with a lot if we think the opportunity's there. And a lot of Latin people, from what I'm hearing, they see opportunity with Trump. They remember they had more jobs, more money. They, a lot of Latin people have uh, private small businesses, um, cleaning businesses, trucking businesses, uh, uh, mowing lawn businesses. But they're small business owners. Trump made the climate great for small business owners. I don't care if you mowed lawns or washed dishes. Um, if you had kind of your own thing going on, it was wonderful for you. And it went down. Inflation went up under Biden um, and inflation's bad. Uh, and, and I've seen this argument on a couple of liberal shows where they would say, well, look, are you going to place your pocketbook ahead of your civil rights? I, I don't agree with the dire uh, comparison they're making there, but I think a lot of people will. I think a lot of when it comes down to it, I have to feed my family. I have to provide for me. That's why I came to this country in the first place. And this guy is going to set me up. And this guy doesn't seem to make opportunity zones, doesn't seem to get that businesses did not bounce back fully from COVID, and doesn't seem to get that inflation's bad for all of us little people. That's that's very obvious. And Marcus, can, Marcus, can I make a, 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 a statement about one of my greatest political fears? And it has to do with... Uh, our inability to talk with one another as uh, indivi as individuals and discard the, the labels of ethnicity or religion or uh, skin color or, or doesn't matter. Um, I started a men's political discussion group about 14 years ago, meets at my house every month for lunch. And we are a group of liberals, conservatives, independents, Republicans, Democrats, uh, and progressives. And we, uh, it started out as an experiment for me to see if after coming back to the United States, after being away from it for 20 years, we could actually sit down and talk to one another. And we actually can do that. But uh, I, I think that the presence of television cameras and cell phone cameras and recording devices of every type uh, is impeding our ability to sit down and be honest and open with one another. We're guarded, we're cautious, uh, or uh, taken the other extreme, we're aggressive and threatening. And this is uh, totally destructive for our country. My latest book called Culture Held Hostage is based on my observations over the last few years about aspects of our culture that are being changed, not naturally as we might through uh, a cultural evolution uh, of change of generations, uh, etc., but being changed by force. Uh, and you never really uh, uh, can profit from a decision that is uh, created by force. Uh, it will always rebound. It will always, like a boomerang, come back at you. And I think that unless we solve our basic problem of being unable to talk to one another, the pendulum is going to swing back and forth every four years or every two years for the Congress. And uh, we'll never get anything done. We are wasting precious time and precious $33 trillion in debt. We're never going to get out of this hole unless we fix some very systemic problems. That's, um, that's very insightful. Uh, I want to ask you a question about that as, as we wind down. It relates to the whole sure. series. When did you notice, again, you've been around in America for a while, you've seen other countries, when did you notice that, and I, I was looking at a picture of you with uh, George W. H. W. Bush, senior, oh, yeah. senior, man. senior, yeah. yes, um, yeah. Um, yeah, he actually understood foreign politics, um, people forget how well the first Iraq war went off and we had Arab uh, allies doing that, you, you almost never see that today, anyways, 
when did we stop being able to talk to each other? I imagine you go back to Bush seniors period. Yeah, there was politics, but we could still talk to each other. At what point, Professor, and I'm not asking for scientific observation. I'm asking you as a human being, just American who lives here. When do you go, yeah, that's different. When, when did you start to notice that, sir? Okay. Uh, thanks for that. That's a good question. That's a great question. Um, but let me answer it by giving you a little uh, preface here. And the preface is that okay. uh, one of the most uh, uh, destructive uh, and uh, periods of time that I lived through was the Vietnam War years and the uh, problems that we had after the assassination of our leaders of uh, JFK, RFK, Martin Luther King yep. Jr., yep. Uh, et cetera. So that uh, upended America's confidence in itself uh, considerably. And it took us quite a while to recover from that. But most recently, uh, if you ask me that question, uh, uh, most recently, it would have to be the election of Bush and Gore. But mm. that, that, to me, uh, after the fight uh, through the Supreme Court with the state of Florida uh, and everything else, that separated us into two distinct uh, camps, two groups of people that uh, would not see eye to eye on anything, and it mushroomed out of control after that. Uh, we had periods of time where uh, we uh, moved uh, one step forward, but then we also moved two steps backward. Uh, and uh, I, for me, and I wrote uh, a book about the uh, Trump years, uh, a 400 page book. And, and uh, one of my uh, hypotheses is that all of this started with the, the Bush Gore election. And Interesting. It, uh, it, it just got worse after that. And, and I don't think anybody can prove that, but uh, that's my contention anyway. Well, there's a lot of theories. Uh, certainly the Bush Gore election was the um, birth of the famous red blue map. I did some reading yes. on that. Red blue had never been permanently assigned liberal and conservative. It went back and forth. And then the 2000 election, they locked in red means conservative, blue means liberal. And here's this divided map of America. And we never got rid of it from them. That was the election that that was the birth of the red blue map stayed with us. Uh, what about 9-11? Didn't we come together as a country? I know people supported Bush, at least for maybe six months, a year until he started going after Iraq. But wouldn't that wasn't that a period of the country coming together or, or was that one step forward followed by two steps back, as you just said? Yeah, I think you're right about the latter. It, it was one of those seminal moments in American history where we all felt threatened by the same enemy. And I think that is the, the key to understanding how America comes together. It is only when you feel you're threatened by a common enemy and that your ox could be gored, to use the old expression, uh, in addition to somebody else's, that we uh, do drop our minor differences with each other and uh, come together as one. But one of the things that surprised me, Marcus, was the fact that uh, we didn't come together during the COVID pandemic. Right. I would, I would have thought that that was another seminal moment where Americans could come together, drop their political differences with one another, or even cultural differences, and say, oh, we have a common enemy, let's figure this out. But uh, instead, we reverted to our red-blue map, as you mentioned before, and uh, the red, red state governors and blue state governors proceed to do what their particular um, ideology demanded of them and uh, how they protected their citizens was based on that ideology. So that's really surprised me, to be quite honest with you, uh, was how we reacted to the COVID problem. Um, so maybe all bets are off marcus and that there is no litmus test to bring americans together anymore that was going to be another question you headed me off that's good um we we talked to a few uh sociologists and social psychologists professors who studied COVID 19 they said the same thing as you absolutely shocking that this ripped the country apart instead of bringing it together. I've even heard America was the only country that that happened in. Maybe there was one other, but basically when you look around the planet, 
most countries came together as peoples to deal with COVID-19, and we we didn't do that here, and that was um, different. Well, it was a it was also based on a lack a growing lack of trust in our uh, institutions. Americans uh, realized then. Wait a minute. Uh, the National Institute of Health and the CDC, uh, maybe they're not uh, infallible after all. Maybe Dr. Fauci is not uh, actually a saint in uh, human clothing. Maybe uh, we shouldn't be too trusting of government. So the, the lack of trust or the basic mistrust that a lot of people have of their own government uh, was able to grow because of the varied decisions that were taken uh, by so many different people during the COVID pandemic. Whereas many other nations, and I know uh, people in many other countries, uh, approach the situation in a very different way. Those countries with solid uh, track records in uh, immunization and virology and medicine uh, were able to, to gin up their experts and their experts were able to prove their hypotheses uh, and those hypotheses were taken into public policy and public policy ended up protecting their people. Whereas we, we just, uh, COVID just became another political party. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, we can't survive with this kind of mentality. Uh, there needs to be uh, more trust brought into government, but the only way to trust our government more is to uh, call them out every time they put a, a January 6th protester in jail for a year and let uh, other people go. And this two-tiered justice system that we have right now that protects some but not others is uh, is. Uh, antithetical to America's founding values and beliefs. I was, uh, and I'm not taking a stance on this, but this was just something I, I heard. America's approaching um, Russian levels of political prisoners in prison because of January 6th. Technically, you can call it a crime, but it was a political event. And so you go into prison technically for a political event. We're approaching levels where we have more people in prison for politics than Russia. Um, I, I find that disturbing, uh, regardless of what you think about January 6th. I don't think that's a good group to be in, included with. Well, uh, and you should find it disturbing. Every American should find it disturbing. I worked in Russia in the 70s under the when Brezhnev was oh, wow. uh, leading the uh, Communist Party. And uh, I saw uh, with my own eyes how the Russian people got around uh, their government. Mm -hmm. uh, they created a subterranean economy, a black market economy. Uh, they uh, uh, listened uh, politely to uh, Pravda and Izvestia, the two primary uh, news sources they had, but they uh, winked an eye at each other saying, uh, yes, this is just propaganda. We know it to be so. But they were the Russians were patient people. Uh, they were uh, uh, also a very proud and stoic people, and I learned a lot from them when I worked with them. But uh, the, with respect to the political prisoners, uh, that's the dark side of, uh, of any uh, uh, nation is uh, how many people it puts in jail for no crimes at all or, or misdemeanors or, or lesser serious crimes. Um, that's a whole other conversation for a whole other time. That is the lawfare uh, approach that's being taken now, where the lawyers are essentially becoming uh, members of SWAT and are uh, uh, out in the courts uh, challenging everything that a particular part of their uh, political party doesn't like and will absolutely destroy the opposition uh, through the legal system if they can. Uh, that's not jurisprudence. That's not prudence, and it's certainly not uh, judicial. Uh, it is an a, a abuse of our system, and no American should go to sleep at night uh, confident that he or she can wake up and not be accused of something they didn't do, because they could be. The, the thing that, since you're an expert on it, the thing that grasps me, i got to ask you this question, because I'm a scholar of sure. history. Um, 
So I remember hearing, um, I took a Russian literature class in the 90s, oh, right after it, wow. it collapsed. And, and, and our professor had studied in Russia, and she loved the Russian people, and she loved the Russian culture. No, she didn't think the government was perfect. But the people are not the same thing as the government, as I always say. She said the Russian people were beautiful, great culture, very loving. Uh, the thing that she taught me was that there was this phrase during the Soviet Union, and, and I think you, the Soviet Union, Aaron, you kind of hit on it. It was something like this. The people would say, well, you pretend to lead and we'll pretend to follow. Meaning they, they didn't buy it anymore. But they were just going, they weren't going to revolt, but they didn't buy it. Nobody bought what the government was saying. Nobody felt the government worked for them. And so they had this kind of lackadaisical level of support. And no, they weren't going to revolt. But then when the revolt happened, there were no Russians standing up for the existing government. They, they had totally lost loyalty. And I, I, it seemed like that shocked the Soviet leaders that nobody's going to stand up for us. Well, no, because they stopped believing in you guys decades ago. They just didn't revolt. And then you have the Soviet leaders unable to get that. And then tough times come and the whole system collapses very quickly. And nobody, as I understand, in America or in the Soviet Union thought it would collapse that quick. Could we possibly draw parallels to today? We have the lowest faith in Congress, the presidency, the Supreme Court, the legal system, and any form of government except for the military. And we have the least ability for Congress to come to negotiations, pass bills. We have the least productive Congress, I think, in the last 20 years. At what point do we get to where the American people are going, uh, yeah, you, you guys pretend to lead, and I'll pretend like I believe that you're actually out for me instead of, the corporations and I'm just here. And at what point does that sentiment get so bad that we're basically as ripe as the Soviet Union to just suddenly collapse one day because we don't have the actual faith of the people and our elected leaders are completely oblivious to that? Wow, that is a very well posited statement um, and shows that you think at the 30,000 foot level, <laughs> Thank that, you. Uh, that's all right. I think that what has happened to the United States today is that uh, the movement towards being off grid has grown substantially. The uh, belief in the system protecting you has all but disappeared. Uh, but when E pluribus unum becomes every man for himself. Right. Uh, the next phase is anarchy. And uh, there are very, I guess, few people maybe that are thinking about life in terms of a chess game instead of a game of checkers. And uh, every chess move uh, can be countered by another move and is predictable. And so is geopolitics. And so is human nature in the Soviet Union and now Russia. Uh, human nature conquered a bad economy and a bad government. People at, at a point, and it started in Poland with Lech Walesa and right. the Solidarity Movement. Uh, when they saw an opening in uh, in the wall, they they made the opening larger. They created uh, constituencies and partnerships. And uh, in terms of the Soviet Union, the Republic broke up, became uh, self-sustaining, self-sufficient um, countries, if you will, on their own. Uh, but there were always these empiricists uh, who believed in uh, history uh, not changing and that the uh, history of Russia should be that of an empire and empire building was the only way forward. So I guess the short answer to your question is that when human nature and a bad economy and a government collide, something is going to give. And that something is going to, uh, and the success of that something is going to depend on who uh, has the reins of power and control. And uh, at some point in time, people are saying, go ahead and sue me. I don't care. I'll move to another, I'll move off the grid, or I will uh, thumb my nose at your subpoena. Uh, so 
we're in for some very uh, turbulent times ahead, Marcus. And I, I pray that uh, we don't have something like another COVID outbreak just a few months before the election. Wink, wink. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to touch that. Uh, YouTube is very, um, well, you know the game. I get what you're saying. I just can't go into that. Um, exactly. I get what you're saying. I, yeah, we're, relax, YouTube. Well, I'm playing by your like rules. That. I'm playing by yeah, YouTube well, rules. I get it. Sure, of course, of course. But all I'm saying is, and I'm a big fan of YouTube, uh, I need to say that right away because I get an awful lot of information, good information out of YouTube. Uh, but I think that YouTube also is a product of human nature. Uh, YouTube is a product of the natural need uh, for human beings to want to communicate with one another. And uh, how we do it is uh, going to be the key to our success or our failure. So keep doing what you're doing, Marcus, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, having talked to you today. Last question, and we'll let you go. Very last question. Sure. You're talking about the 1960s. One of the things that I found talking to some experts was they said, okay, the 1960s was more violent than now, but here's why now is more dangerous than the 1960s. In the 1960s, people might be violent, but everybody agreed so-and-so won the election. We need to follow the Supreme Court. We should follow these universal institutions. Now we have a system where people don't like each other and they don't believe in common institutions and following common institutions and following common values. And we didn't we didn't have that in the 1960s. Just, I will defy whatever the Supreme Court says. Your guy did not win the election. I don't care what the Justice Department says. That wasn't exactly there. And that's here now, and that's a new and scary development. Sure. What are your thoughts on that? Real quick. Well, there, uh, real quick, a couple of thoughts. One, uh, the pervasiveness of social media and the internet and our ability to communicate with one another has increased at lightning speed since the 60s to the point where uh, if a tree falls in the forest, it's going to be heard uh, thousands of miles away mm. uh, because uh, someone will... Uh, will tweet it out uh, or exit out or whatever they call it. Uh, and and uh, the other uh, comment I wanted to make was that uh, we have changed as a people dramatically since the 60s. And uh, as you pointed out, the faith in the institutions uh, have crumbled to the point where uh, we are, we've lost our way plainly and simply. And uh, there is a, a uh, hopefully, uh, a group of people who still believe in the Constitution and uh, the Bill of Rights and the, uh, uh, in the Declaration of Independence and everything that we stood for. Uh, and we need the people like yourself to talk to others and get their views on these subjects, because the more enlightened we are, the more light we bring into our lives, uh, the, the better off we're able to see it uh, farther into the distance. That was perfect. I normally ask for any comment, but you nailed it. Uh, we'll end it there. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for answering all these questions. Uh, thank you for paying attention. I, I find America to be in a very dangerous spot, and it, it still blows me away. Which some people just go, it's fine. And I'm like, no, we need to be taking this more seriously and having these kind of discussions. So thank you for doing that. Welcome, Marcus. And please send me a link to your uh, your podcast there so I can listen uh, to all the dumb things that I've said. <laughs> no, I'm going to email you soon and we'll go from there. Thank you for coming out. We'll end the interview there. I'll email you very shortly. And I want to say thank you for coming out. Okay, Marcus, have a good life and have a nice evening. I'll talk to you on email. Okay, bye. bye, -bye. bye. Uh, well, that was our interview. Thank you very much for coming out. We have more interviews scheduled coming up and we'll bring that to you very shortly. Thank you very much.